Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for July 2nd, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on this podcast is the whole team, including Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writers Y Tran Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, guys, it's it, it's been a weekend. Uh, it went by so quick, at least for me. Uh, let's talk about. Let, let's start off with what we've been doing. Uh, Jacob, I heard you bought a new 4K television. Uh, yeah, uh, as listeners may have may or may not have noticed, I've been gone for the past few weeks. I've been dealing with some personal crises, my family, and some personal stuff. And in the midst of it all, my wife and I decided we're going to buy a 4K TV and go home to a 4K TV. We've been planning to buy one for a while, uh, but ended up being that one of the TVs we were looking at, which is a 65-inch TCL, uh, was on sale at Target. And we got it that plus a uh, Xbox One to play uh, 4K discs for the price we were, wouldn't pay for a TV by itself. So it ended up working out really well. And I don't know how many people out there know TCL. They're a Chinese company. They're kind of the new kid on the block with TVs. And from what I understand, and if you're a listener who knows more, you can correct me on this. I believe they buy Samsung's old parts, or not old, but unused parts, extra parts, and make, essentially make Samsung TVs out of Samsung parts and just puts TCL on them. So you're actually getting a really high-quality, good TV for a fraction of the price you'd pay for a Samsung or a Sony. And I'm really impressed by it. And I know all my friends and family who bought them are impressed by them. They're really good TVs. And it's just been one of those cases where we previously had a TV in the 50-something inch range. Now we have a 65 inch. It's like, oh, I'm already used to it <laughs> within a few hours of putting it up. It's like, can't go smaller ever again. Anything smaller than this is, is bullshit. I'm done. Um, but yeah, we also uh, bought a new couch. So we have our living room got remade entirely. We we're all 4K'd out, comfy couched out. Uh, we bought a big stack of 4K Blu-ray discs, and it's just been – it's been one of those cases where it's like, oh, our our living room now feels complete. Our house, for the first time, feels like uh, our dream movie-watching space is finished. That is very cool. Um, do, did you have to upgrade your other equipment? Like, do you have, like, an Apple TV? Did you have to upgrade that to 4K as well? Or uh, well, our, our, the TCL comes built comes with a built-in Roku, which I wasn't expecting to be impressed by until I started using it. And right now, we haven't touched our Apple TV since we started using the Roku. Uh, between oh, the wow. Roku and between um, the uh, Xbox One, uh, we haven't we haven't, we haven't we haven't turned on the PlayStation Four. We haven't turned on Apple TV. Uh, I mean, well, those devices will get relocated and used elsewhere in the house with with another TV. Uh, but uh, it. It's been great. Like I love the Roku layout. I love the remote. I love the remote for it. I love that I can use my phone to control all aspects of it. Um, I, I do miss uh, not having ha- having access to iTunes through Roku, but I have Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, all the usuals. I have all the other channels that we use, all the various uh, cable logins we have through our cable. So I know there are people out there who prefer Apple TV for whatever reason, and Apple TV does have a better 4K selection for streaming. But as somebody who does this 4K movie watching mostly through discs and and streams stuff that's not really 4K available, the combination of the Xbox and the Roku and that's built into the TV has been everything I personally need. Yeah, see, I'm I'm so like beyond discs at this point. Like I'm all into digital libraries and you know streaming services and. I uh, invested very heavily early on in Apple TV or in iTunes, so uh, I don't have a 4K TV yet. But if I were to get one, a lot of my movies that I bought through iTunes in HD, they uh, for free upgraded them to 4K. Um, so I would think that I would have to get a 4K Apple TV just because I have so many things in that platform. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't be, on, be be against trying this Roku system. I, I tried like one of the first versions of Roku and I wasn't impressed, but I've heard they've made uh, quite a bit of advance since. since yeah, I love, I love that you can have your phone linked up to your Roku and you use it to navigate. You can use the controller, but you also use the, your phone to navigate the Roku. You can like pull up a keyboard on your phone. You have to, you have to search YouTube. You have to search all the apps uh, on the Roku. And it just feels really well integrated and easy to navigate, easy to use in a way I've never found the Apple TV to be. 
Interesting. Okay, uh, let's talk about what I've been up to. Uh, I went to Disneyland again this weekend. Uh, I talked about it last week where I went to Disney California Adventure and experienced uh, Pixar Pier and Pixar Fest for the first time. Uh, This weekend I went back. Uh, It was a friend's birthday and uh, got to experience the magic of Disneyland through the eyes of their kid, uh, their two-year-old kid, uh, you know, meeting uh, Minnie and all that stuff. Like, just seeing how wonderful this place is through the the eyes of a children uh, is amazing. Uh, That said, uh, it it, it is very hard to have a kid, like a kid that young in a theme park and navigate the theme park like it, 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 it takes a lot of parenting and a lot of like uh my friend has like this bag like almost like i want to call her like a mom giver <laughs> it's like a bag with like every possible thing for every scenario that they can encounter and uh it, it is a lot of work um yeah anyways uh i i did want to mention i don't think i talked about it last week but uh, I did experience this last week, and I, I, I went on it again this week, and that is Pirates of the Caribbean. They uh, renovated it, and uh, I think we've talked about it on this podcast before, but there was a scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where they were auctioning off uh, some ladies for as wives <laughs> um, in the ride. It was probably not politically correct, which is why they decided to change it. Uh, everybody wants the redhead. They made the redhead into a female pirate who now actually walks around the park as a costume character and you can meet and take photos with. But anyways, uh, yeah, so they, they redid that whole section, uh, which is completely fine. I, it, it's not much different. Uh, it is a little weird that pirates are auctioning off uh, hens now instead of ladies i don't know it doesn't really make much sense but uh it's fine it's completely fine uh i'm actually more impressed there is a scene that they added um if you've ever been on pirates of the caribbean at disneyland right before the the whole thing starts with you experiencing the pirates as skeletons and they're all dead uh, along with their treasure and then at one point you go through this like fog uh version of a waterfall and then you are back in their heyday and you experience that uh that fog is now gone they have replaced it with an animatronic uh, octopus and above it is this cool thing where there's this pirate in a cage and it's cool because you're in this boat going by it and the pirate in the cage is a skeleton and if you watch it while you're floating by it in the boat the skeleton slowly turns into a human or a uh, animatronic uh, pirate, you know, a, a live, not skeleton pirate. Um, it's cool, uh, Disney Imagineering effect. And I think, uh, you know, for a ride that's been there for what, almost you know, over 50 years now, I guess. Um, it's, uh, it's cool that they now have a transition point in, in, in the story. They're still working on this story. It's almost like as if, you know, a company was working on a movie for this, you know, for five decades, and they're still, you know, perfecting it and adding things to it, which is kind of interesting and fun. Uh, and the other thing I did this weekend is I joined AMC Stubbs A-List. Uh, but that said, I have not used it yet. So I, I cannot give you a review, review. But I can tell you this. The app itself is so much cooler and so much more functional. And like does not look like a, a jerry-rigged, uh, duct-taped-together app like the movie phone app. Or the Movie Pass app, rather. Um, so uh, I am excited to have an app that actually looks like it's functional and pretty and shiny. Um, but is it worth the ten dollars more a month over Movie Pass? I don't know because I have not used it yet. But uh, Dave Chen, who uh, is with uh, Slash Filmcast and he's a uh, editor at large at SlashFilm.com, did a video. Um, which I will link in the show notes, a video review he used over the weekend, and uh, it seems like he liked it. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so let's move on to HT. HT, what have you been up to? So on Saturday, I went to the March to Keep Families Together, or the Families Belong Together March in D.C., and that was to protest the uh, Trump administration's uh, separating and, and families at the border uh, who are coming from to keep to seek asylum in the U.S. and uh, putting the children in detention. So uh, I went there with some friends, and we went to 
uh, the protest that was in Lafayette Square and then ended up marching to DOJ and the Capitol later on. The only problem was that while this is a really great event to bring like families to and to like really put uh, your uh, passion in, it it was about 90 something degrees. It was more than 90 degrees and uh, there's a lot of danger of heat stroke. There's actually a few medics that like came through and it was kind of frightening, but I came prepared. I had like two water bottles and a hat and plenty of sunscreen. And yes, I even use sunscreen because skin cancer is a danger, everyone. So, um, but it was a really great, inspiring march. And um, we had a, cu- a few uh, celebrities who came there to speak including Lin-Manuel Miranda, who I did not know was going to appear, and just like started singing Dear Theodosia from Hamilton, and everyone started singing along, and it was real inspiring and everything. And uh, some celebrities like America Ferrara and Alicia Keys uh, read some uh, firsthand accounts from some of the families who had been separated. So it was it was amazing to, to see just like all the people who were there and just like the amount of kids too. There are a lot of families uh, who brought like their kids along and uh there's one funny moment where like we we're like marching down the capitol and i saw this girl like run in front of the trump hotel which is now like where the old post office building is and just like scream scream f you to the to the building while her mom just like watched in horror <laughs> and it was hilarious but um it was a uh, it was a really it was an amazing time and i don't really know how many people were there it was like in the thousands um but there were It was one of many marches that took place uh, around the country. For sure. And um, I was adjacent to one in West Hollywood outside the dog park that was right next to the march. But uh, it it looked insane. I'm I'm, I'm so – it it is – I mean, I don't want to get political with this podcast, but uh, it is insane that we even have to have a protest for this. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, let's move on to Brad, who uh, has been – sweltering in this summer heat and is braving for you for everybody out there he has to put a uh, he has to tur- turn off his ac to record this podcast so we all thank you brad for uh for being the <laughs> hero we need and deserve oh you know i'm just i like making sacrifices for people you know to get medium quality entertainment <laughs> while they drive <laughs> or walk on a treadmill um what, what was but... it about low quality <laughs> it's true it is yeah it's, it's very hot here um and since i live in the midwest it's also very humid uh sometimes when you walk through the air it feels like you're basically just walking through thick air like you're swimming as you're walking across a parking lot or whatever uh so yeah it's been very hot um <laughs> some friends and i yesterday tried to inefficiently beat the heat because uh we don't have pools like you know an in-ground or an out outground pool but a friend of mine bought a couple like inflatable pools and we filled them up with water, but it was hose water. So it was like really, really cold and like too cold to like really be refreshing. So we heated it up a little bit with like some boiling water and like uh, filled up those big like actual water cooler jugs with some warm water to make it better. And it was still really, really cold, but it was it was good while it lasted. The only problem is we were we spent more time setting it up than we were actually able to enjoy it yesterday because about... I don't know, an hour or so when we were relaxing, uh, it started to rain really, really hard and thunder and lightning. So, you know, it was uh, it was a, a bit of a disappointment, but, you know, I guess worth it because friendship and whatnot, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, but uh, before the, uh, the weekend arrived, actually, one of the cooler things I got to do was I went into Chicago to see the official Star Wars in concert um, tour that's been going around. And they're at, right now they're doing Star Wars A New Hope at various venues across the country. And so this was at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, which is like one of the best symphony orchestras uh, in the United States. And uh, the tickets are pretty pricey. So like my expectations were high and knowing the reputation of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, I was like, OK, this, this better be good. And man, they did not disappoint. It's uh, previously I had seen Back to the Future uh, in, in concert and also Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And this one was definitely the best. I mean, you have John Williams' score. It's being played live with the movie. They were absolutely perfect. It was just stunning. Like, there was mo- several moments where I got goosebumps just hearing it live and seeing it play with the movie. And it's it's just sometimes you forget that, you know, there's even an orchestra there. And that, But then, like, you look around and you see all the, the violins playing in unison. Um, and, like, it's just it's so cool to just listen to the score while you're watching the movie and know that it's all these amazing musicians coming together and playing it in, like, a flawless way like that live. 
um, I have experienced the same thing. I would, I saw Back to the Future in concert, uh, I think, a couple of summers ago, and I, I wish everybody had the chance to see a film performed live. Uh, the the score, it, it, it's such a uh, an amazing uh, experience because you, I mean, you can you can hear the score while you're watching a movie, but there's nothing like hearing it and seeing all the work that goes into it. Uh, you know, live, even in the moments that you kind of tune out the score, um, I think is is the most interesting for me. Uh, but let's let's move on to what we've been watching. Uh, you know, I'll start this off because this weekend. Uh, me and my girlfriend Kitra, we binge watched all of Glow season two. Uh, have any of you g- gotten through Glow season two yet? I started watching it. I got I think five episodes in, and I'm very much I, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm really looking forward to finally uh, you know hunkering down and watching the the last few. I think there's only ten episodes this season. Is that right? Yes, I think either yeah ten. And okay, uh, cool. and I think Chris talked about seeing this a couple weeks back in the water cooler, um, and he said uh, I think he said it was better than season two. Is that what you said, Chris? I mean, better than season one. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wrote the uh, the review for Slash Film, and uh, I definitely thought. I mean, I loved season one, but this season was better in almost every single way. Yes, and I I will agree with you. I was uh, shocked at how good this season is. Um, it uh, I loved the first season, but. Uh, that first season was kind of a prequel to what happens. You know, the whole whole thing is about them getting together to record that pilot episode of uh, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. And this season is kind of about them actually doing it, you know, doing the shows week to week. Uh, it captures a lot of, you know, I used to be a pro wrestling fan and half of being a pro wrestling fan for me was kind of uh monitoring what's going on behind the scenes, hearing about rumors and, you know, these behind the scenes feuds. And uh, when you got to see the actual matches, occasionally some of that real world stuff coming out in the ring in front of a crowd where, you know, an accident happens or, you know, someone who doesn't like someone actually hits someone on purpose accidentally, you know, like things like that. And I feel like this show kind of captures that, uh, duality of the, 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 you know, that they're performing a performance of something in the ring, but there is, you know, real people behind that and uh, what's going on, you know, behind the scenes and in their minds while the things are happening. I think that's very cool. Um, there is kind of this subplot. Uh, it feels like a reaction to the Me Too movement, uh, which is fine, but it didn't seem to, um, for me to... Uh, be more insightful than I think things before the Me Too movement. Like I don't feel like um, it. Uh, I don't know. Th- this show usually uh, impresses me more, and I, I felt like this was kind of uh, what I would expect from that kind of storyline. Um, and uh, you know, I think this show is probably the best, uh, least talked about franchise on Netflix's original series. Like I. Like everybody talks about Stranger Things, House of Cards, you know the uh, the Marvel series, uh, Thirteen Reasons Why, you know all those shows, and I, I actually think Glow is like you don't hear many people talking about the show, and I think it it is brilliant. Uh, episode eight of the show, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but uh, it's kind of a bottle episode, and it is spectacular. Uh, it you know it, it takes its time to get there, but once you get to the episode, I I, I wish everybody could could watch this uh the series um and lastly i want to say about it it is amazing how much wrestling these you know this cast of actresses you know who mostly don't have any wrestling skills or abilities are doing in these episodes i mean the first season they did some training montages and you know the last episode i think had the pilot filming but this season has a lot of wrestling and you can tell it's actually them and not like you know stunt doubles and it's it's kind of impressive uh so yeah anyways glow season two is on netflix right now uh i will also say that i saw ant-man and the wasp again last week uh this is not me bragging about seeing a movie twice before it is released but i wanted to mention something i didn't mention before when i was talking about ant-man and the wasp and that is i've seen it twice now in 3d and it is rare these days that I 
recommend seeing a movie in 3D, but I recommend Ant-Man and the Wasp in 3D. The miniature max maxature like action really plays well with the 3D format and uh you know, I'm not sure if director Peyton um Reed was uh if he was that involved in the 3D conversion? I feel like that's why most of these 3D conversions suck because the directors aren't on board. But this one really feels like whoever was responsible for it was on board and it feels like an actual premium experience. So I would say if you're thinking about seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, you know, maybe see it in 3D. And uh, lastly, uh, I did discover a new YouTube channel. I discovered this guy named Simon Wilson who... You know, I'm talking about here, I'm, I'm actually reluctant to promote him because I, I came across him. It was on, like, the things that are recommended on YouTube, uh, like, because based on my viewing habits. And one of his videos was recommended because he, uh, the video was about, he was at VidCon this past, uh, like, two weeks ago. And, and that was at Anaheim, California. And that's a convention for YouTubers and, and streamers. And he decided to try to sneak into Disneyland without a ticket. Um, so I watched that video because it recommended it to me because I watch a lot of theme park stuff. And uh, it is uh, totally wrong, totally illegal. <laughs> um but uh, I can't tell you, like, how on the edge of my seat I was watching him, you know, almost get caught. And I, I, I went on this deep dive of his channel. His channel is essentially uh, he goes on these, like, 30-day adventures and he'll uh, video blog every day of the adventure. And he's tra- like he'll be like, I'm starting in L.A. and I got to get to New York in the 30 days and I have no money. I can't spend any money. So he needs to either find places to stay uh, scam his way into places, sleep on couches, you know, uh, get food somehow. And it's all the, the reason why I'm so reluctant to, to actually, uh, um, promote it on here is because a lot of the stuff he's doing is, is rather illegal, uh, because he's, you know, scamming restaurants into free food. He's sneaking into places. I think one of his, uh, most watched videos of all time he went to a fight in um, Las Vegas, the Mayweather fight, and he scammed his way in to this fight and scammed his way into hundred thousand dollar tickets. Um, and you get to see he, he him do it, uh, and it's I don't know. I feel like I should uh, I should feel bad about watching this guy, but it's uh, so compelling, uh, but it's so wrong. At the same time, but uh, I, I've been watching this guy. Uh, so, hey, Jacob, you you are a a voice of reason. I think uh, in my life uh, with uh, morals and stuff like. Is, is, do you think it is wrong to en- enjoy some something like this? I'll just answer by saying, as you describe this video, I open it up on my browser and I'm saving it from the podcast is over. <laughs> And it's not – I don't want to say this guy is the most charismatic person in the world, but he sure knows how to talk his way into situations. And uh, I'm very cu- I'm very curious. You got – you have – I know you didn't want to sell people on it, but you sold me hardcore, Peter. <laughs> I would watch uh, – if you're going to watch any of his videos, I'd watch that uh, Mayweather fight one is good or him sneaking into Disney World, Disneyland. He actually sneaked into Disneyland. He had a photo of him in front of the castle in Disney World and went up to the gate, the ticket – uh, take her gate at Disneyland and showed them the picture of him wearing different clothes from a different, you know, month in front of the castle in Disney World and told him he just left Disneyland and showed the ticket taker that, that photo and got in. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's insane. Let's move from there to Jacob. Jacob, what have you been watching recently? Well, uh, maybe about a week and a half ago, I finished watching all of Brooklyn Nine Nine, the first five seasons, and a little while back in the show, I, when the show was canceled and revived uh, in 24 hours, I asked Brad if I should watch it, uh, if I should give it a shot. And he said yes, and I'm glad I gave it a shot because it's an, it's an incredible show. It gives me the same feelings of warmth that I get from Parks and Recreation and The Good Place. Just that sort of that vibe of watching people be friends in a television show. And it's so much harder to, to mine good comedy out of people who love each other than it is the mind comedy of people who are always at each other's throats. 
And I finished it all. And then uh, my wife wanted to start watching it. So now I'm watching it all again with her. And I'm enjoying it even more the second time through. It is such a sweet, nice, funny, weird show. And I, I love every second of it. And I know the uh, Brad, the other big Brooklyn Nine-Nine fan here. So uh, I'll give him a platform to gloat for making me watch it and to say something else about the show if he wants to. No, I, I really like what you said about um, you, how you get the same feeling that you do when you watch Parks and Recreation and The Good Place, because that, that's really how I feel about it, too, is you just get a sense that these all these people, like the characters obviously are friends in the show, but obviously the people working together on the show are friends, and they just they have this amazing, warm chemistry between them that makes everything you know feel that much more genuine and authentic, even though if some of the things that are happening on the show are you know a little bit wacky and goofy, I... I, I just love that the show balances on that, you know, on the cusp of doing comedy that is a little bit unbelievable, but not so unbelievable that it's on the level of like a 30 rock. You know, there's um, there's only a certain amount of absurdity to it. And like, that's what helps, I think, keep it grounded and gives it the, you know, the big beating heart that it has. And that that's exactly why, you know, it's beloved so much and why NBC was was willing to save it after, you know, Fox ungraciously canceled it. You know, it's, yeah. it's interesting that, um, you know, we're in peak television. There's so much to watch. I feel like there's so much I have not seen. But I've seen, you know, Cobra Kai three times. You're watching this for the second time in, you know, a week. Why Why do you think we're attracted to rewatching something we just saw instead of seeing all this great television that is available to us? In this case, it's two-pronged. Uh... One, uh, I really wanted my wife to see this show because Parks and Recreation is her favorite show of all time. She loves A Good Place. And all these shows uh, share a producer and Michael Schur, by the way, we should mention. Even though he does not run Brooklyn Nine-Nine, he co-created it and is a producer on it. And I'm getting, I derive so much pleasure from watching people I love watch things that I love. So watching her discover things about these characters, watching her laugh at the same jokes I laughed at, and watching her learn how much she loves something in the same way that I love it is an extremely powerful and moving experience for me. So that's one. Uh, and two, the world is so crummy right now that the um, the positive, forward-thinking um, world of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is full of cops who are socially responsible and love each other and do their best to make the world better, it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy that feels really nice right now. So that's the case of this particular show. But I think the reason why we rewatch things you know, over and over again uh, when we have other options is going to differ from thing to thing. But that's... Well, that's it for Brooklyn Nine-Nine in that case. But I will talk about something I, I did also watch again for the 100th time, and that is Jurassic Park. I have not seen Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom yet. Uh, I've been too busy with uh, aforementioned family things, but... And rewatching I, Brooklyn Nine-Nine again. <laughs> and rewatching Brooklyn Nine-Nine again. Uh, but I did buy the uh, 4K box set of all the Jurassic Park movies, uh, of which there's only one good movie, but the rest are there. Uh, but the Jurassic Park, man, that movie's really good, guys. That movie holds That movie holds up. Uh, I put it on to see how it looked with some friends who came over just to check out the TV. We all sit down and just all watch it all. We didn't plan to watch Jurassic Park, but we did. And that movie, there's like 14 minutes of dinosaurs in that movie. And every single minute of that movie matters. Every single minute of those dinosaurs feels so powerful, special, and, and either terrifying or moving. I mean, Jurassic World can have all these CGI dinosaurs that have more elaborate shots. But when you watch Jurassic Park, you realize this movie was made at a time when, when the technology was special, when it was so new that nobody knew how to be lazy with it yet. Nobody knew how to make it half-assed. So Jurassic Park is so immaculately made because it was the only way to make that movie. And, man, it, it looks so good in 4K. There are things I was noticing about, the, about production design that I never noticed before. And I, it just made, like, I watched it with a Jurassic Park fan who she had just saw Fallen Kingdom the previous day, and she was so bummed up at Fallen Kingdom and was, like, just sad by it. And watching her light up while watching Jurassic Park again just made my day. And uh, over the weekend, Chris, you watched The Dark Knight again. Uh, you, you talked about that on Twitter. Can you talk about it here? Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to put that on my list, I guess. But yes, um, yeah, so the, the, the 10th anniversary of The Dark Knight is coming up, uh, and I have to write something about it, so I wanted to revisit it to refresh my memory for it, and, because uh, I hadn't seen it in a few years, um, and that movie holds up, it holds up. Um, there are a few things that don't hold up, um, I, I feel like 
the movie is so grounded and that's one of the things that makes it really good. But at the same time, like all of the gangsters in the movie have this really generic community theater accent where they're all like, <laughs> Oh, you, did you guys hear about the Joker? And it's like, all right, this, this is very distracting. <laughs> like every time Eric Roberts is on screen, he says like, use guys like constantly. And it's, it's really jarring. And you know, that accent, it works in movies like Goodfellas because <laughs> the actors Scorsese cast in that part, that's how they really talk because they're they're just from that background and they're not putting on an accent. They just really talk like that. And all the actors in The Dark Knight, they're clearly guys who have never talked like this before. <laughs> so they're all – it just it just does not sound good. But that's like a, that's like a, a minor quibble. Uh, beyond that, the movie is, is really good. Um – it seems stupid to say that now because I feel like everyone knows it. But at the same time, I feel like there's been like a weird over the years, like a backlash where people were like, ah, that movie's not as good as you say it is, but it really is. And it, it changed the face of comic book movies as we know them for better or worse. And uh, it's just, it's still a, it is a classic, I would call it. And not just comic book movies, but like, you know, there was a few years or maybe a, like a half dozen years uh, after that movie that everybody, everything was grounded. Do you know what I mean? Everything was trying to copy Nolan. And I, that, that is my argument to you, Chris. Uh, it is that I love that that part of Nolan's, Batman world is kind of comic booky and it's it's a bit of world building outside of like the groundedness of the whole rest of the movie uh aside from obviously you know the Joker and two you know like the 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 main trio um I don't know I, I feel like a lot of people that copied Nolan and trying to do this grounded thing missed out on the world building aspect that I think he does there. And I, I, I do understand why it's silly or you say it's silly, but I don't know. I, I, I love it. But uh you uh you also watch the entire Mission Impossible series? Over the yes. Uh, yeah, so that this is also for something else I'm writing for the site, but um and of course the new film is coming out and I just got all the they were just all re released on Blu ray, the the original film. So I went back and rewatched them all from the beginning and Man, I love that series. Uh, I honestly think that's that, that might be like the best modern action franchise. I know some people would probably say maybe like Fast and the Furious is that for them, but uh, this Mission Impossible for me is is the best action franchise right now. It's it's one of those rare series where each film uh, gets better and better somehow, and it becomes just this this very entertaining. Uh, spectacle and um, I actually thought like the most recent one Rogue Nation is the best film in the series and how often can you say you know the the fifth entry in a series is the best that's not really a common thing but I, I, I love this series it is funny too that that series is one of those franchises that they do that thing that sequels and franchises do where like they kind of recreate moments from the previous films and I feel like no one talks about that. Like every one of these films has that moment where Tom Cruise is being lowered down to the ground and he almost hits it. You know, like he's uh, parallel to the ground, uh, like the infamous uh, one from the first film. Like it, 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 like it does that, but it's not about that. Like most franchises, you know, the you know Back to the Future vacation of sequels, where like you're recreating uh, action scenes, whole whole film. Uh, but uh, let's move on to – you also watched a couple other movies. Oh, uh, yeah. I saw First Reformed, which I believe HT mentioned last week, and uh, that movie is uh, incredible. That's, that's actually – as of now, that is my number one movie of the year. This movie blew me away. Um, uh, I believe HT said it's a lot like Taxi Driver, and it is because, I mean, it's the same writer. It's Paul Schrader, and it has that same – sort of storyline but uh, this movie is it's almost unclassifiable and ethan hawk is so good in it and uh, I, I won't spoil anything but the last like 10 minutes of this movie uh just just kind of floored me and i i, I like walked into the theater in a daze so uh it's it's still in a few theaters it's actually hitting blu-ray next month in august so if you have yet to see first reformed i really urge you to check it out because it, it's definitely one of the best movies of the year 
And uh, finally, I saw this new documentary called uh, Three Identical Strangers, which is mind blowing. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the story. It starts off this guy. He shows up at college one day for his the first time ever. And everyone on campus somehow recognizes him. And he doesn't know why, because he's never been there before. And then he finds out someone else attending this college is his I, exact double. And uh, it, they were both adopted. So this becomes a big media sensation, you know, reunited twins. And it, it's in all these newspapers. But then that causes another guy who's the third member of this identical triplets to find them. And they're all reunited. And so it starts off as this, like, heartwarming, like, oh, this family is reunited after all these years of not knowing each other. But then the movie becomes increasingly dark and disturbing. And uh, I won't give away what happens, even though it's a true story. But by the end of the movie, you're just uh, knocked for a loop because, like I said, it starts off very happy-go-lucky. And I was, like, laughing and really enjoying it. And then by the end of the film, it was sort of, like, existential dread so uh, it's i really recommend this movie three identical strangers very cool ht what, what have you been watching so this weekend i watched set it up which is the netflix rom-com that has everyone a buzz and it's as delightful as everyone says it's just this really great and charming throwback to uh, late 90s and early 2000s rom-coms that I know a lot of people grew up with. And it has that sort of fantastical escapism to it that makes it so fun to watch. And, you know, you, it has a lot of the tropes that you see in rom-coms, like uh, the the quirky girl who's like a little clumsy or the, the guy who's just, you know, too attached to work. But it it pulls it off so well, and the these are so charming, uh, which includes Zoe Dutch and Glenn Powell, who we've both talked about before. Um, Zoe Dutch, if if this was the rom com era again, she would be like the next Hollywood sweetheart. I'm sure of it. But um, this movie follows two assistants to really demanding bosses who decide to set up their two bosses who are played by Lucy Liu and Tay Diggs to kind of get off, get some free time to themselves. And they end up just getting into all sorts of shenanigans because of that. And it's, it's just so fun. I, I liked it a lot. And I it definitely is a rewatchable with a glass of wine in your hand kind of movie. And uh, I recommend it. I think it's definitely like, it deserves all the popularity that Netflix uh, that it's been getting on Netflix. And um, although I'm a little uncertain about how I feel about a sequel because it doesn't really warrant one. And I get the feeling that the sequel will kind of go the way of a lot of rom-com sequels and just be like a lesser, less compelling version of it. But I really like Set It Up. Yeah, it's it's fun. And I, I love that rom-coms are coming back. I don't know if Netflix is single-handedly reviving the rom-com, but... Because, you know, it is a little bit too much of a throwback sometimes. It's still very white. It's still very just kind of uh, easy. But I really like that we're getting more just rom-coms today. And, like, you know, we're getting later ones like Crazy Rich Asians. So it's it's an exciting summer for rom-coms, guys. <laughs> and it seems like, you know, with platforms like Netflix, maybe, maybe that's where we'll get those kind of stories now. It seems like they've... A lot, uh, mostly been pushed out of theatrical. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate because I hate that rom coms have always been deemed like the lesser genre just because it mostly appeals to women. I think there's some still great stories that can be told in rom coms. Like a lot of our classic movies are rom coms or at least screwball comedies. Like When Harry Met Sally, or if you go back, uh, Bringing Up Baby or His Girl Friday. So I just I just like that people always look down on rom coms. So there's my there's my rant. <laughs> Uh, HT, quick quick question for you is um is Lucy Liu good in the movie? I oh, I like yeah. her a lot. Um, oh, so I'm just she hoping. is she is great. She is as always really funny and really good, um and definitely the sort of like power boss that you expect her to play. But she's just she's so good in it and very charming too. Yeah, this one's in my queue, so I look forward to checking it out. Yeah. And also, you saw "Won't You Be My Neighbor"? Did you cry? I did cry. I cried one and a half times <laughs> during this movie. And uh, I'm, although that's not really like a high standard, I kind of cry a lot during movies. Uh, but when you be my neighbor really just struck a chord with me. I actually uh, grew up watching well, um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood uh, when I was young. I was like kind of at the tail end of his run because he, his 
the sh- the show ended, I think, in 2000. And by that time, I was about uh, eight years old. So I had like watched it for the majority of my childhood. I was always very confused why he would take his shoes off only to put shoes back on. Because <laughs> like, well, you know, this is just like an Asian thing. Like we just take our shoes off and we're like go barefoot for the rest of the house. But, you know, whatever. And uh, his multiple cardigans. But he was a real he was a really important figure for me as growing up as a kid, just because I grew up um, not having cable. So a lot of like the only programming I had was PBS or like early sun- Saturday morning cartoons uh, for like Batman or something like that. So this was a uh, Mr. Rogers was someone I watched every day and I learned a lot of valuable life lessons from it and seeing kind of the man behind the curtain and, and won't you be my neighbor was really just like beautiful experience for me just because I was able to kind of make that connection between from now into my childhood and see how formative he was and how really like what a complex interesting person he was and uh yeah I I, I cried and I'm starting to tear up again now but it's it's a great documentary I highly recommend it uh, HT, I have a question. Uh, I've not seen this yet uh, because of the aforementioned couple weeks I've had. But uh, being at my family's house um, and having lots of nieces and nephews around, I was able to watch the Mr. Rogers sequel show that's airing on PBS these days called uh, Daniel Tiger. Does, does the movie mention this at all? Yeah. So Daniel Tiger was actually, like, according to the, doc- the documentary, the character he invented on his first show. Uh, and then he just kind of moved it on to uh, Mr. Rogers. So I don't know if it was actually a sequel show or if it was a. a oh no, there's pre- an anime, animated sequel show airing oh, right it now. Is. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. It's literally all the uh, char- all the characters from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood um, are all have kids now, and the show follows oh. their kids as they learn life lessons uh, in the same neighborhood. So and no, it, the documentary does not mention that. <laughs> it is super woke. It's full of like all kinds of like like. Um, socially progressive ideas, and it just features like um all the. Th- if Mr. Rogers was still alive today, it it's, it feels very much like the kind of thing he'd be he'd be preaching. Uh, if it feels such a warm, open-hearted, um, progressively minded show, and I feel it feels weird that apparently the show is huge amongst kids and parents, and it feels a little weird that, that the doc doesn't touch on that at all. That the legacy think, goes I, on. I think that there's like I, I could have sworn that there was a brief like flash like reference to it like uh, as far as like when they talk about how his legacy has like continued and like can, like still touches people today i could i i maybe i made that up in my head but like what? i could have there, I could there have are an, a quick oh. thing quick mention of it I don't, I don't remember a mention of it but there are animated segments that may be like similar to it that are like kind of uh take place in throughout the movie so yeah it's kind of odd that they don't mention it maybe it happens later in the credits or something yeah i don't want to derail anything i just feel like i've watched more daniel tiger in the past weeks (laughs) to have movies so i just want to bring it up honestly this is blowing my mind that there is a mr rogers sequel and i didn't even know about it and it's like huge yeah all, all the parents i know love it and watch it it's actually like not it's not a pain in the butt to watch it's like totally watchable for adults well very cool um Jacob, you mentioned that you rewatched Jurassic Park. Well, Brad has you beat. He rewatched Jurassic Park and The Lost World. Brad, tell us about it. Yeah, so um, my girlfriend is in from out of town, actually. Um, we actually recently just made it official, you know, real cool. Like, um, And she lives in Utah. I actually met her at Sundance a couple years ago. And so she's here visiting this week. And I, I've known for a while that she hadn't seen the original Jurassic Park, and she hasn't really gone out of her way to watch it, even though I told her how good it was, because her experience with the Jurassic franchise came from Jurassic World, and she was not impressed. So I made it a point to be like, well, like you need to see the original Jurassic Park, because this is like a definitive movie just in pop culture in general, and I feel like you are actually going to love this one, despite your experience with Jurassic World, because it's just it's not the same, and it's it's just done so much better in pretty much every way. Uh, and sure enough, she she loved it. Like she she even said she got goosebumps during the part where they see the brachiosaur for the first time, um, and you know she was you know, impressed and like floored at how many digital effects there are. Like that she couldn't tell were digital effects, you know, especially when you know you see a full body T Rex and that kind of thing. So it was uh, a success. I was really happy that she liked it. And then uh, we were hanging out at a friend's house, and after we talked about it on my my other podcast that we do we um, decided to watch The Lost World on a whim. 
And that one, uh, she was definitely less impressed by. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I still I still think the first half of that movie is fantastic. Um, you know, the trailer on the cliff sequence is a fa- is one of the, like uh, a fantastic action adventure sequence. Even the raptor um, sequence later is really good. But as soon as uh, they get rescued from the island and go back to San Diego, and even a little bit before that, it's just, it just gets off the rails and gets far too too silly and too too much is going on. It's just uh, it really loses itself fast. But the first half of that movie is still great. Gold Bloom is so good in that movie. He really he really is. Um, okay, let's move on to our last person. And that is Ben. What have you been watching? Yeah, uh, so I watched half of Glow Season 2, like we talked about before. Uh, I also saw Won't You Be My Neighbor in theaters and, yeah, cried multiple times in it. It's, um, it was very moving. And uh, it, the only thing about it is, like, I've seen so much uh, really, like, universal acclaim for the film. And I, I agree that it's really good. I just sort of wish it had gone a bit deeper into... Not that I wanted there to be any sort of or think that there is any sort of like uncovered scandal that needs to happen or anything. I just I wish I had a little bit more insight into the man himself. Like there's this part in the documentary where they start uh, somebody discovers a letter that he wrote and they read this letter. And it's really like a a peek inside, you know, sort of behind the curtain into his mindset at a, a certain time in his life when he wasn't sure that he could keep going And keep, you know, uh, continuing to produce these shows that actually matter to people. And it was like this this rare flicker of doubt. And it showed this extra layer of humanity onto this character that, that, uh, you know, meant so much to so many different people. And I I loved that moment. And I wish there were more insights like that sort of spread throughout. Because otherwise, it's a lot of footage from the old show. And it works really well for people who maybe aren't familiar with the old show or haven't watched it since they were kids or anything like that. But... Um, I, I don't know. I just I wish there was like a little bit more to chew on with the movie. Again, I, I really liked it, but um, yeah. If I had one complaint, that's what that would be. Uh, I also watched Phantom Thread for the first time. I finally caught up with this uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's movie that came out last year, and I kind of wasn't a fan. I think uh, when we uh, we were on the podcast when the first trailer came out, and I remember talking about that, and it's like we were Peter. I think you were asking us like what you know if we thought we were going to like it based on the trailer and i remember saying something like you know this movie might not be for me um and i I sort of think that that that's really what it came down to i I appreciate the cinematography and the production design and you know all the uh the technical aspects of the film but just story-wise uh some of the characters made some decisions that i I was pretty baffled by especially a a relationship that uh unfolds and and uh a twist that occurs near the end where somebody reacts to something that in a way that i'm trying to be vague here somebody reacts to something uh, to a revelation in a way that i did not find appropriate for that character i i I was like in no world would this guy uh be okay with what's going on here but um but i don't know maybe that's just me i know it's not just you i'm in a hundred percent agreement with everything you just said okay all right well i mean i know that everybody a lot of people love that movie and i think it was probably on a lot of top 10 lists even for people on this podcast last year i just uh i don't know it, it was not really my thing but uh, you can i hear had to... chris squirming right now i know, you're I know. Making chris squirm <laughs> yeah i'm very i'm phantom very unhappy thread. with this segment right now, so. yeah i want to say also i love phantom thread so just want to say chris you're on i'm on the same team as you all yeah, right. and I mean, let's I start our own podcast right now. Yeah. Phantom Thread Rules laugh. Podcast. <laughs> uh, I laughed a lot in it. I thought the a lot of the like the withering disses were were pretty phenomenal. Um, so, and I remember you saying that, Chris, that you you laughed a lot, and like nobody else in your audience was really laughing. But uh, I, I did find the movie very funny at the times when I think it wanted you to think it was funny. Um, so I think that it had that going for it, but. Um, overall, it just wasn't really my bag. Uh, two other quick things. I rewatched It Chapter One. It was on HBO. Man, that movie is so good. Um, <laughs> I also I went for a run the next morning and like right around my apartment and a I'm not making this up. A lone red balloon was just floating in the in the path <laughs> in front of me. 
uh, right next to a sewer grate. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you serious? What is going on? Uh, my wife was like, she was with me on the run and she was like, did you come here and plant this before we started running? Like, is this, is this a gag on your part? And we were both like very cautious about running around that area. It was, it was really unnerving. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it chapter one, I mean, we've been writing a lot about, uh, casting and stuff for the sequel. Um, we actually had a, a piece that went up today about it chapter two. And, uh, I'm very much looking forward to that movie, even though I think the first one works so well. And I'm I'm a little worried about uh, the upcoming second half, because I think that that part of the story is not quite as effective as the kid based part. But um, but yeah, I just wanted to give a quick shout out because that uh, movie is on HBO right now. And, and I'm sure it's you can find it on HBO Go and all that stuff. If, if somebody somehow didn't catch the uh, box office behemoth, that was it. Chapter one last year. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention. Final deployment for Queen Battle Walkthrough, which is uh, the next short from the guy who created Too Many Cooks, which is that Adult Swim uh, TV short that came out in 2014. Too Many Cooks, I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. Uh, you've probably covered it on the site. Uh, this was before I was with Slash Film, but it is... Um, uh, basically it's like a, a parody of uh, sitcom intros and it just sort of um, buries deeper into itself and peels back all these insane layers and just gets really, you know, increasingly crazy over the course of 11 minutes or something. Uh, what is this called? Final deployment Four is basically the same thing, but it's through the lens of uh, walkthrough videos for, for video games. And it's like a character will, be you're watch it starts out you're watching uh somebody like through like a like a youtube-esque player walk through this uh, video game and then you realize that that person the host of this walkthrough is actually a player in another video game that somebody else is doing a walkthrough for so it just sort of keeps like um zooming out and there's like layers on layers on layers and uh it, it's really casper kelly is the guy who created this thing and it's um it really sort of cements the notion that he's very interested in uh, perception and reality and like these uh, these multi-layered <laughs> worlds that we're living in. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to that. I didn't like it quite as much as Too Many Cooks, which I think is like pure brilliance. Um, but this has a lot of the same ideas in uh, a different package and um, it's amusing and weird and, uh, and bizarre. So you can check that out online. Uh, it's also um, airing occasionally at random times on Adult Swim right now. Okay, this water cooler is running long. We have a couple more things to talk about, and I think people might be interested in these things. Jacob, you had a tabletop game day, and you played a bunch of games. Uh, tell us about them, because I know uh, often when we talk about these on the podcast, people write into the to the mailbag and ask me where they can get these games. So I know uh, they like hearing about this stuff. Yeah, I had a few friends from out of town and a few friends from in town come together, and we played uh, about five hours of board games. Uh, the most common one we played, one you can find uh, at Lost Stores, called Cash and Guns. Think of it as uh, Reservoir Dogs, the board game. Everybody points foam guns at each other and shoots each other and tries to knock each other out of the game and collect loot. It's a really fun, very simple, great party game, lots of bluffing. The other two aren't quite as well known, and one of them is Captain Sonar, which is a very large... Um, very stressful game where uh, think of it as Battleship for adults. You have uh, two teams of four, preferably, uh, divided by a barrier that separates a table. And each person is uh, a member of a crew on a submarine. And the captain controls the submarine on a grid where he keeps track of where he's moving and must shout out his directions, north, south, east, west. Meanwhile, each team also has a radio operator listening for the other player's captain uh, as they shout north, south, east, west and try to pinpoint where they are, but keeping track of their directions even though they can't see where they're going. And other players run the engines and run the weapons. And it's played in real time. There are no turns. So you, you, the game moves as fast as you can. So Captain go north, south, east, west, north, south, east, west, or whatever direction he's going. And the other team has to try to keep up with that. Or they can move as slowly as you want and be patient. And it's just intense and stressful. And each game is about 30 minutes long. And when it's over, like, everybody's just exhausted. But it's so much fun. And I, I've also played that game. That game is fantastic, and it's 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 very stressful. I, I I think like every time I've played it, we've only played it like two or three times because at that point you're like we need a break. 
it, when, you, when you win, and uh, I won one of the games as a captain, which is a great feeling because with the captain, when, when, when you lose Captain Stonar, everybody looks at Captain and said, well, why'd you screw us up, Captain? And it's always we always do it jokingly, but the captain definitely has the most stressful job on the, on the boat. Uh, so winning as captain was, was a lot of fun. And the other game I play, we played was uh, Viticulture, which is uh, thematically very different. It's a game of uh, running, uh, running a winery in Tuscany. And it's by the same designers who made Scythe, the uh, Kickstarter sensation from a few years ago. But it, instead of being a war game or a combat game, it's just uh, uh, planting fields, harvesting grapes, crushing grapes, make wine, and selling wine to fulfill orders and get uh, reputation points. Whoever gets the most reputation points wins the game. And as somebody, I know a lot of people are instantly attracted, maybe games of conflict and spaceships and monsters and shooting things. And I love those too, but I also love games that have such intentionally mundane themes because I love the idea of how relaxing it is to sit there and build my winery and sit there and try to make decisions about where my grapes go and what kind of fields I want to plant. And then because it's all wine Mm -hmm. and grapes, it's even funnier when things go wrong. Like if we get into a fight in a a game where there's spaceships, like, oh yeah, we're screaming because there's lives at risk. We're screaming because there's uh, people firing lasers at each other. But when you're screaming about how, Damn it, why'd you take my grapes? I wanted those grapes. <laughs> it becomes so much funnier. And Viticulture is just this really solid, pretty straightforward, streamlined game. It's relaxing and fun and just brain-tickling enough uh, to be like a good medium-weight game. Like, it's a good game to try to, like, maybe introduce slightly heavier European-style games to your friends without throwing them in the deep end. And I recommend it highly. I also enjoy that game. Uh, HT, what have you been playing? So I'm going to take a page from Brad's book and say I've been playing a new album. Uh, So so this is a music uh, water cooler, but this is kind of related to a water cooler I did a couple weeks ago related to Kingdom Hearts. So Utare Akaru is the theme singer, uh, the singer for the theme songs of Kingdom Hearts games, and she's been consistently singing the songs for the past 12, 14 years in which the games have been being released. And uh, I've through Kingdom Hearts became a big fan of Utare Akaru. I just, I'm actually like a big mega fan of her. She's one of my favorite artists and I own all her albums. And um, so sh- she released a new album this year called Hatsukoi, which means first love in Japanese. And uh, it's actually sort of a callback to her very first debut album from 1999 called First Love in English. And uh, this is a really exciting album because it's her second album after her 10-year hiatus that she took. Um, Her last one was Phantom, and that was kind of her grappling with her mother's suicide. Um, And this one is a little bit more, it's much more uh, upbeat and sort of um, optimistic and warm-hearted. So it it kind of has the same instrumentals that we've heard from her for a while, which is like she kind of tends to gravitate towards simple arrangements and um, piano and orchestral backgrounds. But she has some like fun experiments here with uh, like with a new song called True Proud, which is like almost a future bass kind of synthy song with the her like singing in staccato that's like almost rap like and she's accompanied by a rapper named uh javon who's from britain and uh yeah it's a it's a really great album i like it a lot i've been listening to it nonstop. my favorite song from it is probably um anata which is uh means you and it's um kind of like a funky sort of r&b-ish song another sort of throwback to her old old years uh and i'm probably getting a little bit too like in the weeds about this but utara akaru is a great artist and she's more than just the kingdom heart singer so you should check out her latest album hatsukoi where, where can people find this album so this album is on itunes now available and uh it's also available in physical copy on amazon okay last and not least every week on this program Brad talks about the crazy things that he's been eating, the limited edition flavors and whatnot. Brad, what have you been eating lately? Last week, uh, I went out and found new Sloppy Joe flavored Pringles. Uh, I guess kids that like the Pringles. That sounds gross. I don't know. Kids like the Pringles extra sloppy nowadays, apparently. Um, so, yeah, they, they are... You can only find them at Walgreens. And uh, they're actually... They're, they're pretty good. They don't really taste so much like a sloppy joe as much as they taste more like a just a tangy barbecue flavor um, i mean that's kind of how you would s- describe you know what sloppy joe tastes like anyway just like the sauce with with the beef um but yeah it, it doesn't really taste so so much like when you actually bite into a sloppy joe sandwich um just a, a, a slightly sweeter sweeter tangier barbecue flavor 
Um, but I think that they would probably be good, funnily enough, though, and this is something that I, I, I only recently realized was a kind of a good idea, is if you don't have a Sloppy Joe sandwich, even just dipping chips in Sloppy Joe meat is pretty good. And I think that if you dip these chips into real Sloppy Joe, they'll probably be a pretty decent flavor combination. I don't know. That just sounds like too much uh, barbecue meaty flavor in one place to me. I, I, I'm not sure that you can have too much barbecue meaty flavor in a single place, Peter. Okay, you've also been trying the Splits Pop-Tarts. You know, I like Pop-Tarts. What are Splits Pop-Tarts? Yeah, Splits Pop-Tarts, these apparently just came out. I, I actually just saw a commercial for them on TV, so these might be more of a permanent thing or at least a longer run thing than some of the usual weird things that I find. Um, so that's, the, it's, it's a normal pop tart, except it's split down the middle so that there's two different flavors inside and two different frostings on top. And so the, the ones that I found, um, there's two kinds, but the ones that I was interested in were the strawberry cheesecake ones where one side is the strawberry like jelly filling. And then this other side is like this, uh, kind of like cheesecake cream cheese filling. And then the frosting on top is the one half is the regular like strawberry frosting, and then the other side is like this red drizzle uh, on the cheesecake side. Um, and they're pretty good. It's um, so wait, do do you eat them together? Are you like trying to get both flavors? Or are you like splitting it up? Is it like you know, I'll have yeah. this part and then eat <laughs> that part? Yeah, I mean it's, I mean the 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 width of a pop tart is not not really conducive to like getting you know a a bite around the whole thing. But if you take a bite, like right down the middle of it, then you get both flavors. Um, so you like, you can't get both flavors every single time, but yeah, like the whole idea is to definitely get both flavors, you know, when you bite at the same time, of course you can also be that person who maybe is a little bit more anal about details and things like that and just eat one side at a time. But at, at that point, you know, why don't you just go get two different kinds of pop tarts? <laughs> Brad, how did this become slash film daily where we're talking about how to eat a pop tart? <laughs> I mean, this this is, you know, your ship. I'm just along for the ride. I don't know. You want to talk about the food. People are enjoying the food, so it, it, it's fine. Anyways, uh, we have run really long with this, so we're not going to say our goodbyes. I am going to say that you can find this podcast published every weekday on com, in iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to peter at com. We do read every email we get. Please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow.